Coming up on DTNS, Facebook is down, Siri is celebrating a birthday, and guess which space captain is actually going to space. This is Daily Tech News for Monday, October 1st, 4th, rather, 2021. I'm in from Studio Redwood. I'm Sarah Lane. In lovely Cleveland, Ohio, I'm Rich Straffolino. And from a balmy Southern California, I'm the show's producer, Roger Jane. Oh, boy. Before the show, we were talking about all sorts of stuff. And if you would like to get that wider conversation, please do so by becoming a patron of our expanded show, Good Day Internet, patreon.com slash DTNS. This is where you can join our top patrons like Alexander Nesef, Hector Bones, and Tim Ashman. Let us start with a few tech things you should know. Netflix launched its Play Something Shuffle feature globally on Android, with plans to begin testing the feature on iOS in the coming months. The feature was limited to TV-connected devices before. The company also rolled out its Last Last feature on Android in select markets. It's already available on iOS, which provides funny clips from Netflix content. And Netflix is bringing its Downloads for You feature to iOS this month, which automatically downloads content to, uh, to watch based on viewing habits, and that is already available on Android. Apple will open pre-orders for the Apple Watch Series 7 on October 8th, shipping October 15th. The device was originally announced with the iPhone 13, but at the time, only promised it would be available later this fall. Now we know. Microsoft is launching Windows 11-powered hardware worldwide on October 5th. So one would assume that's when it's coming out. And it is. Because it's October 5th in New Zealand, even when it's October 4th in North America. But we're seeing some widespread reports that Windows 11 came out early when it arrived in New Zealand, midday, October 4th, from our perspective. Qualcomm and investment group SSW Partners announced that they intend to acquire the Swedish automotive tech company Vianir for $800 million. The automotive supplier Magna International had previously announced it intended to acquire Vianir last month, but was outbid. Don't feel too bad, though. Vianir will pay Magna a $110 million breakup fee. That would make me feel better. A new note from Apple analyst Ming-Chi Kuo claims Apple dropped plans to launch an OLED iPad Air in 2022, citing performance and cost not meeting requirements. Kuo expects mini LED displays to come to the upcoming 14 and 16-inch MacBook Pros, as well as an 11-inch iPad Pro slated for 2022. In other Apple rumors, Bloomberg's Mark Gurman sources say a new Apple Silicon 10-core M1X chip is still on tap for 2021, set to launch with those aforementioned MacBook Pro models in the next month. The free tier of YouTube Music currently doesn't support background listening, meaning if the screen is off, you're using another app and you don't have music. However, on November 3rd, free tier Canadian users will be able to use background listening on standard ad-supported personalized radio mixes, as well as user-uploaded content. No specifics on when this will roll out to other markets, however. <laughs> All right, uh, Rich, let's talk a little bit more about what Amazon is up to. Yeah, some uh, interesting uh, new feature they rolled out. They're letting Prime subscribers in the U.S. send gifts using just an email address or a phone number. You don't actually need the address, it seems. Gift givers do not get access to a recipient's address when sending a gift. So even if they know that information, they don't kind of get uh, the rest of that. Recipients receive an email notification about the gift and can choose to accept, decline, or convert it to an Amazon gift card without the sender, without the sender knowing it. If they choose to get the gift card, they would know if they declined it. And if you don't reply to the uh, email, it'll refund the purchase in a couple of days. Amazon confirmed there is no way for recipients, though, to opt out of receiving gifts entirely. Mm. And, yeah, and I, I feel like that's where this is running into some murky waters, right, Sarah? Yeah, I mean, listen, if somebody is going to send me a gift, they don't know where I live, they don't know the address, they only know that they can do this through Amazon, there's probably not too much of a physical privacy issue going on. But the fact that I might get something that I didn't ask for, don't necessarily want, and could potentially, you know, in a worst case scenario, be stalkerish. I don't like that. 
Well, and the other thing is we've been trained. I mean, one of the big draws for this from Amazon's perspective is Prime subscribers can send this to anyone. You don't need to ha have an Amazon account to kind of receive this. It'll prompt you to sign up for an Amazon account if you click on the link. But this seems to me to be like the opposite of all anti-phishing behavior that we've kind of trained people on is like, if you get right. an unprompted email from someone, don't click on the link, whatever you do now. Yeah. I know hopefully like, if you get an email from someone, I would, if like from like my brother sent me a gift, I would just text them and be like, hey, did you send me an Amazon thing? Yes, okay, I feel better about clicking on that. But you know, hey, click on this to get free stuff from Amazon now has a veneer of this might not be a scam. So you might wanna click on that link just in case somebody sent you, you know, a free pair of slippers or something like that. That to me is is the bigger issue, obviously, stalker where or you know what however you, this could be used to make people feel uncomfortable or unsafe it, it could be unsettling for sure uh but to me the not having the opt out for me is a big fishing concern at this point yeah and uh, i mean as somebody who gets uh emails i'm doing air quotes from amazon mm -hmm. all the time being like please you know something's wrong with your password you know please you know like really bad phishing attempts uh, this is part of life, and I know that the Daily Tech News Show audience is, you know, you're you're pretty up on this stuff. But there is something a little unsettl uh, unsettling about all of this, um, and part of it is, yeah, like the gamification of this is, you know, that's one thing. But just the fact that you might get something delivered to you from somebody who doesn't necessarily know where you live, but you know, wanted to give you a gift, that could be great. Sure, maybe it's from your aunt and it's Christmas or something. But if it isn't, that is something that I think a lot of people aren't totally prepared to deal with. I, I do like though for the holidays, they do give you that out being like, listen, Aunt Linda doesn't really know what she's doing, but you get that gift card. You could still, well, you know, you still spend it on Amazon. We don't care. We won't tell Aunt Linda. It's fine. Thank you, Linda. Yeah. <laughs> All right, let's move on to Facebook news. And boy, is it a Facebook day to day. Let's start with the whistleblower situation, which is uh, a story that we've been covering here on DTNS for the last several weeks. The whistleblower who provided documents that served as the foundation for the Wall Street Journal's Facebook Files series came forward as a former Facebook product manager, Frances Haugen. She worked at Facebook for almost two years before leaving in May of 2021, so earlier this year, working with the company's civic integrity team. Following the breakup of the team on December 2nd, 2020, she contacted a Wall Street Journal reporter. Documents leaked to the journal came from Facebook Workplace and were open to all employees. So this is something that she had access to, but a lot of other people did as well. Haugen said she expected to be caught by Facebook's internal security as these documents were not related to her position. She's scheduled to testify before Cond Congress this week and filed with the SEC for federal whistleblower protections. With the civic integrity team, Haugen focused on issues around how Facebook could impact global elections. She described Facebook using understaffed teams to build tools to deal with larger issues like malicious targeting of specific communities and detecting and combating human exploitation. Haugen described the civic integrity team as an understaffed cleanup crew. In a written response to the story, Facebook spokesman Andy Stone said, quote, we continue to make significant improvements to tackle the spread of misinformation and harmful content. To suggest we encourage bad content and do nothing is just not true, end quote. In completely unrelated news, but I mean, here we are, Facebook, Instagram, WhatsApp, Messenger, and even Oculus VR are all currently down as of this recording. Going offline around 12 p.m. Eastern stand uh, Eastern Daylight Time, rather, on Monday. According to Cloudflare, Facebook's BGP routers have been withdrawn from the Internet. Facebook is showing a generic error message, while Instagram shows a 5XX server error message. This appears to be impacting internal Facebook services as well. In fact, there are some folks who work at Facebook who say, yes, we cannot <laughs> communicate with our other Facebook brethren, everything is down. Social features and downloading new game functionalities are also offline. Basically, Facebook's DNS records, the things that tell computers where to find the servers associated with Facebook's domain names, all gone. Facebook controls its own domain servers, so 
it's likely not an attack, but more to be a configuration error, either by design or a mistake. Hard to say. So when you try to go to facebook.com, the internet just responds with a version of, I don't know what that is. I don't know where you want to go. That would affect every Facebook and Facebook related service, including internal emails and tools. Twitter user CPK underscore KC suspected the, configura the configuration error may have made it impossible to fix itself remotely since the domains are all gone, meaning that they would have to get physical access of the machine to restore service. Or, as Tom put it on Twitter, Facebook seems to have done the equivalent of putting the auto exec dot bat in the <laughs> auto exec doc bat because Tom loves an Asian DOS reference. <laughs> <laughs> yes, yeah, so, Rich, I mean, Rich, I, I don't even know where to go with this. It's so weird. This yeah, is the, this has been the weirdest day. <laughs> um, and you know, there are a lot of people who are like, oh, well, I don't even use Facebook, doesn't apply to me. Well, you know what? Billions of people do. And this is uh this is this is downtime like I've never seen before. I, I was texting a friend that this is like being on the internet in 2002 or something <laughs> like that, where you're like, you're like, uh, I guess where do we go? I can't share a picture, you know, stuff like that. I know there's plenty of other platforms that can do that. Going back to the whistleblower story, just really quick, since we're still kind of waiting for, I'm assuming Facebook's going to figure out how to bring up services. My instinct says this is a blackout like this does nothing given the news of the day. Like this has to be a technical error and someone's just having the absolute worst day possible uh, mm -hmm. on their technical end. Uh, in terms of the whistleblower stuff, uh, this there's not a lot of new news on this. The 60 minute piece that came out, uh, it kind of in conjunction with this disclosure, this this whistleblower coming forward, kind of reiterates a lot of the reporting that was already out there. The thing that stood out for me, and I just think is very bizarre, is that whole thing about this. All these documents that she pulled were from Facebook workplace. This wasn't her like using someone else's credentials or creating a shadow identity that you know had some sort of access. She literally was just going through there, like just looking through old slide decks, looking up old researchers, and kind of looking at their notes and stuff like that. And the fact that, you know, um, um, insider threats are like a huge corporate uh, of security priority. And there are solutions out there that will analyze traffic patterns and how you're accessing networks and stuff like that. That to me is, is a huge eyebrow raiser that nothing that she was doing kind of going outside of her domain, accessing all these files, downloading those files, um, didn't raise any red flags over the course of seemingly months uh, to get to that point, um, you know, and, and in the story, you know, she kind of even like was putting in her search history kind of like a, a yeah. goodbye to, to Facebook at a certain point. So that to me is is the main kind of like eyebrow raising, um, you know, it, it kind of fills out the story of why these disclosures were coming out there. Certainly that's very important, um, but like not anything I think particularly new other than Yes, Facebook was devoting resources to a lot of these very important issues on their network, but seemingly, uh, you know, putting a lot of pressure on very small teams to solve very huge issues, which, you know, some uh, obviously uh, 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 Ms. Haugen saw that as being, um, you know, not enough, inadequate or, you know, uh, an understaffed cleanup crews, she said. Yeah, I mean, you know, we, we don't cover all, uh, you know, uh, um blackouts of various platforms because these things happen. This is a pretty significant blackout. Um, and not only for all of the people who use Facebook products, but all of the people who work internally at Facebook. And from, you know, what I've gleaned from uh, folks who do work internally, I mean, it has crippled a very, very large company. And again, this is as of recording, who knows when it will be turned back on or fixed, but uh, pretty, pretty, pretty big news for a Monday. And I'm sure we'll cover the the details of what actually happened when and if those come out. Indeed. But if you if you uh, maybe we're taking the time uh, with Facebook and all those other apps being down, maybe doing some online shopping, you probably noticed some buy now, pay later services wherever you were checking out. Uh, you know, this is something that has really been on the rise in the past couple of years, especially uh, we've kind of seen that surge in the U.S. This is considered a form of consumer credit and is still relatively small in terms of market share as about $97 billion in volume. And that's about 2% of the global consumer credit uh, market in 2020, $97 billion 
a lot by my standards, but not by the global credit uh, market. But with younger consumers, uh, they're increasingly wary of large credit card balances, and they've hit their lowest level since 2017 last year. So this is making more traditional credit companies kind of take notice of these services. In January 2018, a firm owned the buy now, pay later market in the U.S. with over 95% of market share. Since then, foreign competitors have entered the market with the firm now third behind Afterpay and Klarna, so just you know, in a couple of years. All of these services have or will have big e-commerce partnerships. A firm is partnered with Amazon and Shopify, not, not uh, uh, small fish there by any means. Afterpay is in the process of being acquired by Square and kind of going after more of that, uh, you know, that mega uh, shopping all-in-one app kind of experience. And Klarna is targeting traditional retailers like H&M, Walmart, Sephora, and in Germany where they have uh, an even uh, larger presence, uh, you know, and these buy now, pay later services in general in Europe kind of have a bigger market share. Uh, they're actually operating as a bank in Germany. So kind of, you know, very different ways of approaching this, all kind of offering that same core service. The draw here for merchants, because this is something that I've always kind of hadn't dug into, is like, why would a merchant necessarily want to? Uh, buy now, pay later options, get better conversion rates, and overall higher purchases, often without having to discount goods as steeply to move them. The trade-off here, though, is that merchants reportedly pay between 3 to 8% of transactions uh, for most of these services, much higher than traditional, uh, you know, uh, just card processing fees or stuff like that. But, you know, not having to put a big discount to clear merchandise, kind of a big deal. I mean, Sarah, you've, I, I'm sure you have seen, uh, uh, you know, no, uh, no lack of these kind of services at checkout, right? Uh, indeed. Um, and what, I don't know. I feel like a story like this is sort of like, well, you know, look, look at these financial chefs based on, you know, human buying behavior to me and please, you know, check me if I'm, I'm missing something. It's like, this is just credit card companies being like, this is how we prey on people who can't afford things. And we actually get more money out of them in the long term. And it's just presented to the customer as something different and something better. I, I've seen this compared to something like layaway, even though in this instance, you're actually like getting the good, you know, uh, kind of ahead of time. I mean, really what it comes down to for a lot of these uh, uh, companies it, with, with these kind of partnerships, especially I think um, with um, with. Uh, Afterpay and the the Square acquisition is really trying to own that customer relationship when it comes to uh, anything re revolving payment processing, whether it comes to credit, uh, you know, short term credit, long term credit, uh, or just immediate payment processing. Just kind of owning that whole experience, owning all that information that comes along with it, uh, which can be incredibly valuable. Um, that acquisition has not gone through. Uh, is you know still uh, you know still waiting to close on that. So we will see if that uh, does come to pass. Um, but you know, kind of a kind of an interesting, you know, need to keep a to keep a bead on this, given how quickly it's kind of ramped up. And you know, we have rumors that Apple is looking to possibly get into this market with Apple Pay. Uh, all of the big payment processes are also kind of looking on how to get into uh, uh, this market as well. So definitely not something that's that's going away. So kind of, I, I thought it was important to you know kind of talk about. Uh, you know, what, what are the implications of this? Who's what what benefit of it? What's causing the rise of this? And I thought um, the, the source of this was a, a really great protocol series. Um, so definitely want to check that out if you want some more information. Indeed. Um, and we will be following the story as <laughs> it unfolds. <laughs> if you're interested in video gaming, we talk about video gaming here on DTNS. Maybe you don't have time to follow all the stories. You can check out DTNS Gaming News Monthly. Every month, Jen Cutter rounds out the biggest video gaming news in about 15 minutes. Whether you're already a hardcore gamer or thinking about getting into video gaming, the monthly summary will bring you up to speed. Just look for it in your DTNS feed. And thank you to Jen Cutter for doing the work. All right, let's talk about a little bit of an anniversary that we have to celebrate <laughs> today. Apple announced its humble personal assistant, Siri, 10 years ago today at the launch of the iPhone 4S. If that doesn't make you feel old, I don't know what will. Remember that? iPhone 4S. Yes, that is when Siri was announced. According to Apple's Phil Schiller at the announcement, quote, what we really want to do is just talk to our device and your device, in that case, your phone, will figure out what you mean and help you get what you want done, end quote. It was quickly followed by Samsung's S-Voice, Google Now in 2012, then Microsoft's Cortana, Amazon's voice assistant in 2014. Voice assistants are a big deal now, but, you know, 
just 10 short years ago, it was kind of novel. While being one of the first personalized virtual assistants in comparison to series rivals, it hasn't really capitalized on its first mover advantage, however. Reporting on the years has laid blame to various factors from Google's larger trove of user data to train its voice assistant to confusion with Apple over what series focus should actually be to a slower annual update schedule and lack of third party supports. Yeah, I mean, when that I, I very distinctly remember that 4S launch, uh, it's like my favorite iPhone design. So whatever reason that sticks out, but like Siri did like at the time and, and looking back at the reviews, the Verge did a great job of kind of profiling the reviews back in 2011, uh, you know, very glowing, very, oh, this you know, is a game changer with virtual assistants, kind of definitely grading it on a curve uh, sure. in a lot of ways. Yeah. But looking at, you know, up until that point, my experience with most voice assistants had been like Google's 411 service. I don't know if everybody remembers that, but like, you know, that was all like kind of automated oh, yeah. voice prompts. And it, you know, yeah. it was pretty hit or miss. Or like, I mean, I remember like my dad had an old cell phone where you'd like literally had to train it how to like say people's, how you said people's names so that you could call them. And the fact that it could, you know, Siri could handle a lot of very basic tasks seemingly uh, within a, within some very narrow confines did feel uh, like a big improvement. And, you know, I, I, not to, you know, uh, uh, you know, poo poo where Siri is at right now. There's a like if you're in the Apple ecosystem, right? And you're, right, you know, you have your iPhone in your pocket with your Apple Watch and your AirPods. It is a very like that. That is an ecosystem where you can do a lot with voice. And I think that is where Siri is kind of focused now is kind of be, uh, allowing you to extend and even with the HomePod and stuff like that, being able to extend that have a very consistent feel. Whereas a lot of other ecosystems, we're talking about Google. Yes, it works very well on a phone, but if you don't have that whole ecosystem and there's yeah. maybe less of a reason to buy into it, you know, it doesn't have a problem. Still, though, it, you know, I, I think that's been the narrative kind of dogging series. Like, it's like it's usually like considered, I don't know, maybe second best. And it, despite being the earliest, seems unusual for Apple one to be earliest and kind of not to have the most refined experience out of the box is, I think, what always raises eyebrows with that. I have to say, I mean, I remember when, you know, Siri launched, I, at the time I was commuting in my car a, a fair distance to, you know, my place of work. And so, because I would be like bored in my car for an hour at a time, you know, I would just be like, Siri, tell me, you know, two plus two, or, you know, hey, what's, what's the giant score? You know, I, I would, I, I was trying to like, uh, trip her up. Right? Mm -hmm. right, trip him up. Siri is, mm -hmm. you know, omnipresent and it has no gender. But, uh, but you know, at the time it was like I was like, this is really cool. But like, how uh, helpful is this to me outside of the fact that I'm, you know, in a car and I can only really, you know, use voice uh, stuff to get answers because I can't look at my phone. I mean, ten years ago, that was sort of Siri to me. Was like, oh, this is like really helpful when it would be dangerous for me to look at my phone while driving. And the fact that the virtual assistants, you know, dime a dozen, you know, and they mostly work the same way. And the fact that the internet of things devices in the home has exploded. All of that, you know, the whole Siri thing was back in the day was like, oh, I just, you know, tell my phone to give me like a easy query and it will that Siri. <laughs> and now it's, it's, you know, it's, um, Apple kit, uh, you know, or home kit rather, um, or, you know, it's a variety of other platforms that all do the same thing. And that is now what we think of voice assistance as, and that happened very quickly. You know, it didn't take that long for us to be like, yeah, I got it. Yeah. You know, you, you can participate or not, but, uh, it, 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 it it's funny how these things get adopted so quickly. Yeah, I will say perhaps the most enduring uh, uh, like kind of legacy, I don't want to say that about an actively developed product, but like the idea that a, uh, like a voice assistant has a personality, definitely, mm -hmm. you know, that I, I feel like we can we can always look to Siri as the starter of that trend for sure. Indeed. All right, well, we've covered the semiconductor shortage on a number of levels on the show, from the impacts to consumer technology, very obviously, to national security implications, and even in venturing into the automotive industry. Now, a production cut on silicon metal in China has sent prices up over 300% in the last two months. 
China's Yunnan province accounts for about tw or over 20 percent of the country's silicon output. But that order uh, that was ordered to cut production by 90 percent through the end of the year to curb energy usage is kind of an ongoing story within China. It's why they were seeing a big crypto crackdown there as well. Silicon is obviously used to make semiconductors, but also has a wide range of uh, other uses from being the raw material in silicone to be uses in concrete and glass. This could continue to hammer automakers, where silicon is part of aluminum alloys used in engine blocks. Silicon is also used in the solar industry for photovoltaic panels, with the cost of solar-grade polysilicon to its highest levels since 2011. However, this recent shortage has done nothing seemingly to curb investment in semiconductors so far. We'll see if that continues, though. Crunchbase reports that global venture funds semiconductor startups hit $3.7 billion in August, already surpassing 2020's previous record year. U.S. venture funding had already surpassed 2020 levels back in April and now stands at $1.6 billion of funding as of August. It's like toilet paper, but for, you know, <laughs> yeah, the, sh the shelves are empty of all of our, of, of, yeah, of all of our. There, there, there's some, uh, yeah, some hoarding going on here. Um, this is not surprising to me, Rich. Yeah, well, what is what is surprising, I guess, is this. We, you know, I, I'm very curious to see how far we'll see this kind of China energy crackdown, basically, or this this you know this concerted effort by China's central government to essentially bring down uh, energy usage throughout the country. What other industries and knock on effects we will see? You know, we we could you know uh, uh, obviously okay production of silicone and thinking how does that impact chip manufacturing, which already was strained because for, for a variety of other factors, like it just seems like it, the, the semiconductor shortage can never catch its breath for lack of a better term. And given how, uh, you know, essential, uh, you know, China is to just kind of the global supply chain, even with, you know, ongoing sanctions and stuff like that, undoubtedly we will see further knock on effects to this. It sounds like from, from the, the, the pieces I was reading, like the solar industry probably is the most insulated, from this, um, but you know, automakers are already kind of globally halting production uh, kind of across a number of different lines. And uh, you know, if if it goes from not having enough chips for backup sensors or for you know the the ton of ensuite security to, hey, we can't make engine blocks, uh, you know, or or it's much more expensive to make them, uh, that's you know that that not great news for them. indeed. Um, and also anybody who's like, what's the difference between silicon and silicone? Well. <laughs> Hard to know, uh, but, uh, you know, look it up. All right. We've got some good news for William Shatner. There's some William Shatner uh, fans out there. The man is set to become the oldest person to fly to space at 90 years old. That's right. Shatner is set to fly on Blue Origin's second tourist sp space flight on October 12th aboard the New Shepard and will break the record of 82-year-old aviation pioneer Wally Funk, who flew on New Shepard back in July. Sadly, the flight is only scheduled to go past the Carmen line boundary between the Earth atmosphere and outer space, well short of a second star to the right and straight till morning. I know that you uh. people who understand space <laughs> understand that joke. And I By had to be told about it uh, between <laughs> Roger and Rich before the show. But I, I got to say, William Shatner, y'all, 90, 90 years old, ready to go to space. God bless you. I mean, I remember when it was a big deal when John Glenn, I watched that in school, I remember. Mm, like, we, like, shut yeah. down class to watch John Glenn go up in his, in his, in his uh, uh, you know, his uh, as a senior citizen, go up into space. I do kind of feel bad for Wally Funk. You know, he, he gets, like, the privilege of being the oldest guy in space for, like, four months. <laughs> Yeah, it's like you were 82, dude. I mean, William like, Shatner's 90. Yeah. By the way, William Shatner's 90? I mean, I, I mean, again, I mean, I'm I'm both I, surprised I but, but also not surprised by that revelation. No, but hey, no. I mean, I, I, I it's the role he was born to play. I, I think that's that says something <laughs> to the uh I want to say maybe the, the the smoothness of the flight. Like I don't I don't know like Obviously, this puts strain, clearly puts strain on a body. I hope William Shatner is okay at 90 years old. But, like, I, I feel like this isn't, like, the same level of, hey, we're going to the moon, like, sh bullet shooting out of a gun going up. I hope uh, that, uh, you know, that Bill makes it back okay. That's what I'm saying. 
Um, before we move on, Wally Funk, oh, a woman. I apologize. Uh, Wally, uh, we appreciate you. And uh, <laughs> now I feel oh. extra bad for Wally Funk. Uh, uh, <laughs> well, double, double listen, edge. Wally Funk is Wally Funk, and she has done uh, great stuff, and she will never be forgotten. <laughs> uh, let's, uh, before we put our uh, foot in our mouths anymore, Rich, check out the mailbag. Well, we got an email from Toby on the Fairphone, and they say, it seems to me that it is a great option for the security conscious. The ability to get inside the device easily and physically disconnect and remove components is a very low tech and relatively low skill way to de-risk the device for sensitive environments. I had forgotten about the Fairphone until the DTNS piece, but even as an iPhone user, I'm now giving it serious consideration, having taken a look at what I actually use, especially now as more computing time is done from my desk with increased uh, work from home, a five-year warranty and replaceable battery seems compelling. Yeah, it uh, really does. I'm Toby, with you on thing, that, Toby. The one thing I will say is if you can open it, anyone can open it. So as long as it's in your in your physical presence, it is good for the security conscious. That, that would be my only caveat to that. I mostly agree with you in principle. Well, if you have any feedback for us, like Toby, or questions, comments, anything we talk about on the show or might talk about on a future show, please do send that feedback our way. Feedback at dailytechnewsshow.com is where to send the email and thank you in advance. We would also like to extend some thanks to our brand new bosses. We got a few of them over the weekend. Martin Israel, Nathan Ernest, Mike and Plumber Sanderlin, who all started backing us on Patreon. So thank you, Martin. Thank you, Nathan. Thank you, Mike. And thank you, Plumber. <laughs> and thank you to all our patrons who support us every day. We could not do it without you. Uh, reminder that we're live on this show Monday through Friday, 4.30 p.m. Eastern, 2030 UTC. You can find out more at dailytechnewsshow.com slash live. Thank you to everybody who joins us live. And if you'd like to, please do. Tom's back tomorrow and we'll be joined by Nate Langson. Talk to you then. This show is part of the Frog Pants Network. Get more at frogpants.com. Diamond Club hopes you have enjoyed this program. <laughs> <laughs>